Hello everyone watching on YouTube and listening on Spotify. It's another episode of NRG Insights and we're still with our lender series at the moment. So discussing all things lending um, and all things relevant to the market with, uh, with influential people within the market. Uh, so today, today, well, I doubt today. Uh, today, I've got Josh Knight um, from Octane Capital, Sales and Marketing Director. Thanks for joining me, Josh. No worries. Thanks for having me on. No problem at all. So talk to me. Let's start with this as we start with everyone. Tell me about your financial services career to how we've got to this point here at Octane. Okay. Yeah. So my, my first job um, after university was a very much a, you know, cutting my teeth in the cold, harsh reality of sales, you know, hundreds of cold calls a day. Um, I stomached that for about a year and then spent the next six years um, selling tax efficient investments to financial advisors at Octopus Investments and then uh, subsequently Mariana Capital. Grew very, very bored of that um, and then made the jump into property finance in early 2018, not too long after Octane launched. Been with Octane ever since, so six and a bit yep. years now. Um, started as a BDM, then a senior BDM, and then end of 2022, uh, promoted to sales and marketing director, which is my current position. So Amazing. A split you've been, you, you, you've been through quite a uh, you've been through quite a journey there, right? Just in regards to the you know some tricky years and some some interesting stuff. So you've been there you've, you've been there for a fair whack. How's that? Um, how's it been, and how are you feeling about the market now? Um, yeah, well, I mean, there has there has been some kind of turbulence in the market, and I think actually that's one of the reasons why I love working at Octane so much because I think Octane has really shown what kind of outfit they are and how they've treated their people through those periods. So through COVID, through other you know turbulence that the company has faced in that six years, you know, I, I've always felt very well treated at Octane. So I think that's an important point to note. Mm. In, in answer to your question about the the market, you know, I think the specialist lending market sort of thrives when there's a bit of turbulence in the mainstream sector. You know, yeah. if you're a, if you're a broker that has been focused on, you know, residential mortgages and buy to let, and you you'll have really felt that drop off in transactions. So then it's like, you know, how do you how do you boost your business? And and many of their maybe more vanilla landlord clients will be turning to alternative strategies, holidays, yeah. HMOs, whatever it is, multi-unit blocks. Um, and you often need to partner with a specialist lender to achieve achieve those those goals. And how have you been, I mean, I'll kind of ask this question because we did have that transition from vanilla resi into everyone wanting to try specialist lending, right? properties are better. Um, it's more commercially, you know, there's, there's, there's more commercialness to it than, than just sorting out someone's mortgage. However, not everyone has the specialist understanding that some of the specialist brokers do. How have you gone about kind of educating people in, in regards to that? Because um, it's quite a shift for some people, you know, it's not, I know the properties are bigger, whatever it is, one and a half, two percent, it's still, of nothing, it's still nothing. So how do you, how do you educate them on, on how to adapt to the specialist market? Yeah, I think... I think it's about giving brokers that aren't that used to dealing in this market comfort that you will hold their hand through their first couple of deals. And one of the things that we do at Octane is that when, when a deal comes in, you get assigned one credit manager that underwrites the deal from start to finish. You've yep. got their direct contact details. You can call them, you can email them, you can have direct access to them. But we don't have case managers. The, the BDM that has dealt with the original inquiry also stays through the deal from start all the way really. to the finish. And that's a, that is a very conscious decision that we've made so that the, the broker has two points of contact to help guide yeah. them through. And bear in mind, the BDM only gets paid when the, the, the deal completes. It goes through. Incentivized and you're aligned in that sense. So, we, so was yeah. that sorry to interrupt? Was that was that a specific, like you said, a conscious decision about the customer journey, or is that yeah. is that was that a, yeah. is that just the way you've always done it? Very much so. No, we we very consciously not um, created a case management um, team because we feel that, like I say, the B, the BDM is incentivized to drive the case to completion, mm -hmm. and 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 often the BDM fights the corner of the broker. You know, sometimes a decision will be made by the underwriter or the credit manager that the broker won't be happy with. 
And then, yeah. you know, sometimes the BDM needs to go <laughs> into battle um, on their behalf. Yeah. And How does that work then? How does that work without the... Because the BDM is essentially the case manager. Then obviously yeah. you must have that BDM underwriter. Um, I mean, everyone has that BDM underwriter clash because every BDM thinks the case should go... No one puts her a case they don't think should go through, do they? So... Um, how do you manage that? With your, oh, cause you, I know you're managing those guys as well. How do you manage that? Um, well, yeah, it's a cha- it's a challenge. I think look, we are everybody at Octane gets on. Octane is full of good people, and mm. whilst that natural friction is necessary, um, everybody has a kind of one team mentality. So fortunately, it all, it never creates a negative. But I think yeah. it is about pushing boundaries. You know, you are to, to to offer a good service to your brokers. They have to feel that you're willing to go into battle for them and yeah. try and get the best rate, get the best leverage. Um, and that's one of the things I love the most about the job is that it's not just about rate and loan to value. It's about how you structure the deal that can yeah. help you win it. Um, so pushing the boundaries of your credit's appetite is, is part of the job but obviously so that, yeah, I, I agree I don't think there should ever be an issue with this battle between underwriting and BDMs because that's what you're both there for that no one's there to not protect the business right everyone's there to do the to, to get the best outcome as long as everyone is commercially aware I don't think there's anything wrong with that fact that BDMs are always going to fight for the broker right? and underwriters are always I mean everyone's protecting the company but you know what I mean yeah and uh, I agree with you I think you you made a good point there about being commercial we're, we're, we're really fortunate in that our you know, our credit team are incentivized to complete a certain number of deals a month in the same way that the BDM team are. So the credit team are expected to get deals through to through to completion. And, you know, often they are very accommodating to to push back and challenges. Yep. And, you know, that helps being commercially minded that. Yeah, that definitely helps. Yeah, because they get it, don't they? So one, one, one goal is to get the get the money out the door um, and obviously keep the, keep the, keep the customer happy. Mm. Um, so am I right in saying that you, you still deal with customers as well? You're kind of a player manager type. Yeah, player manager. Is that, is that, are you, yeah, yeah, are you happy with, I always use that terminology with everyone, the player, player manager, but how, so let's kind of focus that on you if that's all right. How, how, do, you, how do you cope with that? With both, the billing manager is the hardest job in my opinion because you've got to keep everyone happy and you've still got targets and but everyone has got those. How, how do you maintain balance of your team and and still selling for a while? Yeah, word. well, we're lucky that we got so Richard Deakin is our managing director of sales and he oversees the whole management of the sort of sales function. So we're lucky yeah. in the sense that he is the sort of driving force behind that. I do wear a few different hats, which is. Kind of challenge because yeah, you're marketing as well aren't you so that, that there's a lot in there yeah yeah we did actually we've just hired somebody on the marketing side which um has really helped to to relieve some some pressure but the the, the bdm stuff that's my favorite part of the job you know right. if, you, if you took that away from me i would be lost you know that's the bit i, I like being out there being scrappy fighting for deals yeah. winning deals i still if I'm honest with you, I just like completing deals. And I was thinking about this actually today. Bizarrely, I I get the same buzz from completing a small deal as a big deal. And you'd, yeah. you'd think that it would be disproportionate to the size of the deal that you've completed. But for some reason, for me, it isn't. I just like get it. You know, just there's love a it. huge satisfaction in getting a deal over the line because there's, there's so much stuff that can go wrong. Um, yeah. So when you finally get there and navigate all the hurdles that naturally arise, I just get I just get massive satisfaction from that. You know, even that's even good. That, I mean, that, that's that's what you want out of your sales team as well, isn't it? Right? You've got to, because that's that's the customer centricness of you, if that's a word. Mm. Because that's what's giving you joy. Because it's not about the cash through the door; it's about the the, the deal being done. Yeah, and look, you complete a small deal for a broker, and you never know. You know, the next week you might. Because yeah, you've looked after the little one, you know. Yeah. Hard work breeds luck, and you know you end up sometimes falling across a big With deal. Monsters. Yeah. Well, I've spoke to people having the same, that same conversation where they've had like 150, 160 grand deals, and then that's led on to their biggest 24 million pound portfolio type thing. You know, it does it happens, doesn't it? You've got to look after the small relationships. Yeah, definitely. And then this is you know something that we say you know across our team is that 
especially when a new broker submits a deal, irrespective of how easy, difficult, big or small that deal is, you you treat it with such, such, such importance. They have to feel yeah. that, you know, your service is going to blow them away. And that's, we, we've got really strict SLAs that we all, both in the credit team and the sales team, operate within. We constantly make people aware of them. AIPs in two hours, cases fully underwritten in 48 hours, you know, valuation reports and underwriting items um, reviewed and responded to within 24 hours. You know, these are what we think are industry leading service levels and we really, yeah. really, really try and stick to them. Like you said, it's just about the, the broker journey. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 know I, I speak to lots of bridging lenders, obviously, and they, um, it's hard to just say you're quick, right? <laughs> There's got to be more than that, you know. There's got to be that level of customer service. They've got to want to come back to you, yeah. Um, because you can't. Everyone's fast <laughs> if the legal's done properly. You know, what I mean, there's not the, the USPs for for bridges are, are so tight. And it's not always on rate as well, right? Not everyone can be the, the cheapest. So that relationship stuff is really important, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, and I think also just being honest about timeframes and and SLAs, like like you say, there are lenders out there that can complete deals in 24 hours. We're not one of them. You know, yeah. so we don't, you know, we don't do dual rep, we don't do AVMs, and naturally that means that our time frame for completion is a couple of weeks at best. And mm -hmm. you know, so when a broker brings us a deal and says, "Can you complete on Tuesday next week?" Tomorrow, <laughs> it's not, not one for us. You know, there are lots of yeah, yeah. That, that, that do, and that's the great thing about the bridging market because there are lenders out there for all different types of deals. Yeah, you've just got to be honest about what you can deliver and then and then deliver it yeah yeah do what you say you're going to do is the uh, prime thing that seems to be coming up more and more in the podcast just do what you say you're going to do like the most the most important thing yeah and and then with slas i think you know again when an application comes in look we're straight back to the broker thank you for your application this will be fully underwritten in 48 hours you will hear from a credit manager within that time frame and then you deliver on it and then it's normally nice. within 24 and then you you know, <laughs> yeah, under promise, overachieve, and all that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, what's what's your sweet spot? Would you say in the market? Where what? Is it, have you got a specific kind of deal that you think these are for us? You know, these are our these are what we're best at. Yeah, I think so. Our two biggest areas are probably refurbs and developer exits. Yeah, and I think I think what we've started to notice is that it's any project that involves some form of refurbishment. Because even on the developer exit front, what sets us aside is that we're willing to step in before practical completion. Right. So often there is a degree of residual um, or remaining refurbishment works that need to need to be done before the project can go on the market for sale, um, or at least um, reach practical completion. So refurbs, we look at all all types of refurbs: light, decorative, loft conversions. Uh, change of use projects, house to HMO, house to flat, commercial to resi. And then on the dev exit side, it's anything from one house to 100 houses, um, whether they're finished or part complete. Nice. Um, so just on, in regards to that, how have you got with, with sort of costs going up and that kind of thing for investors? How are you, how are you educating investors as well? Are you, are you, do, you kind of, do you delve into that kind of advising them? Um, or is, um, it, is it more yeah. getting the brokers to understand it? Well, we look if we if we're looking at a refurb that's a hev a heavy refurbishment, we would insist on a fifteen percent um, contingency usually. Um, yeah. Even if the borrower hasn't built that into the loan, uh, sorry, built that into their figures. So when we're sizing our refurbishment, our drawdown tranche, that would be inclusive inclusive of contingency, and that's just a yeah. the borrower. If they don't need to draw that money, there's no non-utilization yeah. fees and they don't get charged interest on it. But Got it's yeah. in there to, because look, like you say, bill costs have gone up something ridiculous like 25% since 2020. Yeah. We know that costs can escalate and we don't want to be in a position where borrowers are overexposed. Good, good, good. So talk to me about kind of the, the relationship management side of things with your brokers there. What, I know we've kind of, we've, we've touched on it. Through, through the slightly tougher times that you've been through, how important has that been to, to kind of, you know, to stay in contact with them and, and how have you done that? Um, well, I mean, at the moment, I think for, for us, it's tough 
for lots of our brokers, but it's you know we had a really good year last year because I think yeah like I said before that that turbulence in the mainstream market creates opportunity in the specialist space. So mm-hmm. for us, it's just about making helping brokers to find ways of driving business when perhaps they've seen a drop off in their resi and their buy to let book and helping them educate their clients that you know if you're a frustrated landlord and and you've been used to single tenancy properties that there are ways out there of increasing um your or improving your yields you know hmo conversion being being a big one so for us i saw you talking about this somewhere the other day actually I don't know where that was. I mean, we'll, we'll go through social media in a, in a minute. I'm, I, saw, I saw you discussing that about the different potentials that people have to look at. I can't think that, well, I don't think that was on. Was that, was that on another podcast or was that on, a, on an Octane video? But um, we're, we're often um, shouting about it, so I'm not surprised that you, you've seen us talk about <laughs> it. But I mean, house to HMO conversions are a massive sweet spot for us. Yeah. And I think, well, we think at the moment they are the perfect antidote to landlords being frustrated with their yields being eroded by rates going up, running costs going up, EPC yeah. concerns. Um, you know, landlords are in how much do you have to how much do you have to push on the brokers for that as well, Josh? Just like the like getting them to getting them to tell their customers to think outside the box. Because it must be tough because you're you're always going for an intermediary, right? So how do you yeah. how do you kind of educate them? Is that just like like we said then how how I saw it, it was just yeah, well, I think it's, look, you're pushing on an open door there. If if you're trying to find ways of helping your brokers to write more business, you know, any commercially minded broker should be all ears. So hmm. even if even even if they're not used to doing bridging and refurb and this end of the commercial finance market, you know, they're the ones really, if anything, where the biggest opportunity lies because they've got, a, you know, a book of landlords that maybe aren't, buying properties at the moment because they're the, the yields just aren't there for them anymore. Yeah. So I think I think actually like as a as a BDM and as a business trying to add value in that way sets you aside a little bit because if if all you do is go out and shout about your products and our criteria dropping. <laughs> and some, sometimes I I am conscious that you know, we probably have 20 to 30 really close competitors. Mm-hmm. And and I'm always aware that whenever I go and meet a broker, I mean, it's funny, sometimes you leave the broker's office and there's one of your, BD, you know, it's your, your opposite number at a BDM um, from another this isn't uh, This hasn't been come out yet, right? But Andrea Glasgow at HTB said the exact same thing the other day. She said, do you know who is walking in the opposite direction? It's always the same people. Cause yeah, obviously exactly. the, the, I said, do you think the broker's actually set that up on purpose? It's a bit of a... Well, <laughs> so, <yeah>. <laughs> But look, I mean, that's indicative of how competitive the market is. So, look, you know, you, hmm. you doff your cap to the um, to your opposite. Yeah. Line, but just let their tyres down outside. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Smash the window. But look, that, that's the that 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 shows how competitive the market is. And hmm. like I say, you can't just be a mouthpiece. You can't just yell at brokers when there's so much noise in the market and they're getting told by fifty different bridging lenders how brilliant it, they are. Yeah. If you can try and be creative and try and help them drive more business, then that will hopefully make you stand out a bit more. That, that's the secret, right? Not, and not just to be being a BDM. Any business in it's adding value. Like, I'm in. I'm in a. I'm in a market where there are hundreds of people, and I don't yeah. think there's many competitors who add as much value as we do. And I just think that's because we made a, a conscious effort a few years ago of how to separate yourself from the crowd. And I think that's like you just said, then. You know, we can't do it on rate, we can't do it on fees and that kind of thing, but what you can do, you can add as much value as you possibly can outside yeah. of the thing we do. Yeah, and I think look, a great example of that is that, so my colleague Francesca was at an event in Bristol yesterday and lots of the brokers that she spoke to uh, um, were perhaps not as familiar with this end of the market, and mm. but they do have a big book of landlords that they can they can access. And what we what we did for a few of those guys was put together a marketing email that didn't have any op, nothing to do yeah. with opting on there. It just no. secret code in the back of it. Just really yeah, in, in the hope <laughs> in the hope that if it drives business, it will come our way. But yeah. you know, hand a marketing email over to a broker that they can send out to their database 
to try and help them drive business. Um, you know, and that's something that's that, we've, that we've done before or write pieces for their newsletter if they if they do one or similar, you know, outside of just the normal shouting yeah. out how great you are. That's a, that is a smart way of doing it, isn't it? Actually getting... Because it, it, I don't think... The, the brokers don't know what they don't know, right? So if you, like you say, if you're just dealing with lots of landlords and you do that nice buy-to-let and, and um, you're completely unaware of like that HMO refurb market, then it's up to you to educate them on educating the, the, uh, yeah. the investor, right? Exactly right. Exactly. Good. So uh, how, else, how else do you separate yourself from the market? Like you say, I know you said added value there. Um, well, we, we'll touch on it, but obviously you've been dealing a lot with marketing. That's part of your, part of your role. Mm-hmm. How important has, um, has social media been to, to kind of to separate yourselves from the crowd? Or is that quite, you know, that's quite a crowded marketplace as well? How does it, how does it sit with you? Yeah, I think well, I, was, I sort of started using LinkedIn a lot, um, probably a, a year and a half, two years ago. And then I'd say probably 10 to 15% of my business comes from LinkedIn now. Um, and yeah. I'd say almost 100% of my new broker relationships come through LinkedIn. So That's that. incredible, see, because I would think I would think you've been on. If you, I know you from there. Obviously, I've, you know I'm an avid watcher of all social media in in finance. But um, 18 months surprises me that that's how long you've been on it. I would assume longer. I have no, I have been on LinkedIn for much longer than that. But Just not as time, committed as you have been now. You're committing to posting two or three times a week. And then, you know, you, you slowly start to learn what lands better and what doesn't. And it's no surprise that the stuff that that doesn't land as well is the stuff we've completed this criteria. <laughs> you know, people don't yeah. want to see that. Um, well, I think I actually think case studies are an important part of social media because yeah. it has to resonate with someone, doesn't it? If you go, oh, shit, I've got a case like that. You know, there that's, is. that's why it's useful to say, look, we're, we're, we're active in this space. Mm. Do you have a deal like that? And, and I think that has its place. But the stuff that breaks through the noise seems to be the stuff where you're actually genuinely trying to add value without an obvious agenda. To, <laughs> but it is not an agenda. I mean, this is no, there's no secret. Right? I do a podcast on financial services. I recruit in financial services. This is like, it's not. It's not a secret that this is a. This is. That you're adding value, but it's, you know you still have an agenda behind it. I still have a day job that I have to have to sure. recruit. You know what I mean? It's it's the same thing. It's not like it. It feels like a dirty secret, but we're not. The adding value bit is is so we can make more money or so we can in, sure. introduce yeah, more exactly. business and that kind of thing. You know, it's not like um, it's not something we should be uh, ashamed of. There's no no, uh, no one's gonna do it for free. No, but yeah, you're right, and and I think there's so many different topics in our space that. Yeah, even now, six years in, I still learn a new nuance about planning permission or permitted development or, um, you know, the way that you can structure deals. You know, if, you know if, every single week we, I learn something new. And then as soon yeah. as I learn something new that I think could be useful to people that might not know it, then, you know, that's a good topic to talk about um, on LinkedIn. And has that, has that been important to you for your kind of growth? Because obviously you've... you've You've gone through the uh, the stages relatively, relatively rapidly, you know, being, being six years in. Do you think that's been an important part for you, like the the constantly learning? Yeah. Or, or wanting yeah. to learn? Yeah, my dad gave me some great advice. Um, he he said, you try and seek out company where you feel the least intelligent. Yeah. Um, I definitely felt like that and still feel like <laughs> that in many of the circles at Octane because, you know, we're vastly, vastly experienced people at the company, so so learning from those people has been been amazing. Um, yeah. yeah, it's pointless being the biggest fish in the pond, right? Yeah, like, what you're going to learn? There's no there's no no benefit from it. So it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's the point. That, you know, I'd got to that point in my career when when I was in on the investment side where I just felt like I was just stagnating. Yeah, and I thought I look back on that six year period and I just thought had. Have I actually got any smarter here? You know, that was my mm. reflective period. Ha, you know, have I progressed? Am I smarter than I was six years ago? And I, I wasn't sure that I was. Um, and that was really what drove my move into property finance because I've got to yeah. be challenged. And I think that's the danger. If, if you're a salesperson, you can't just be the mouthpiece of the company. You can't just go out and just talk about the same things to the same people. 
and just robotically regurgitate the same words every yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. It just drive you mad, you know. Um, it's, it is true. It's, it's about what needs to be challenged, right? You need it, don't you? Otherwise, you just get into that. Well, actually, you said you look back at those six years. I mean, it is quite... Hopefully, that resonates with some people. That I think that is important to have a look back and, and actually see how much you've grown or if you have. Because I think that's yeah. a good indicator of whether you're in the right place. If you're just doing yeah. the same stuff day in, day out, I think that's a great... Um, that's a great indicator that perhaps it is time to, um, you know, look at look at alternatives like you did. Yeah, particularly in sales as well, because I think you know, people that are great at sales and aren't necessarily the most technical, and, and you don't necessarily have have to have you know, <laughs> a really you don't necessarily have to have a really broad um, skill set to at least get into sales. But you you can't. It's a very narrow focus if you're not being if you're not being challenged and and I think what yeah. we you know I can I have fallen completely in love with this sector that I'm in now because there is so much challenge whether it's you know fighting for a deal structuring a deal to try and win it that internal friction that we spoke about trying to get the deal through credit get it approved all of those are challenges you know um yeah I mean I know you said that now I focus with sales I think it's However, I think you stick out like a sore thumb if you don't get technically better. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if I can speak to recruiters and I think you're not in the same league as me when it comes to financial services because you haven't bothered to learn the market. Yeah. It's the same for BDMs, right? It just, you can't just be a good salesperson because people like talking to you. You've got yeah. to learn that, that technical side of things, haven't you? Yeah. But the, then, you're, then the, your organisation or your industry has to be broad enough to allow you to, to grow and be challenged. And I think that was the yeah. problem that I had is that I kind of knew everything that I needed to know about this set of investments that I was selling and that was it. Yeah. I sort of hit my ceiling and there was nowhere else I could go really. Um, whereas now, you know... But you've worked with the same people, haven't you? you sorry, carry on. I just said, well, well, now it's very different in that there is, there's an infinite amount that I still don't know now, you know, so there's... Mm. so much room for growth. That's good though, isn't it? Yeah, it, it I was gonna, that's what I was going to say. I, don't, I always interrupt, but yeah. Exactly that. How much room for growth you've got, knowing that there's so much more to learn. It's um. But I'm right in saying that you're when you were selling investments, you're working for this, or you're working with say similar people. Um, you are now. Did you, did you move over yeah. with? So I was at Octopus Investments. Jonathan. Um. Yeah. So whilst I was at Octopus Investments on on the investment side, that was during the period that Jonathan, who is Octane's CEO and founder, he had started. Yeah. Um, Dragonfly Property Finance um, alongside uh, Matt Smith who is our Director of Credit who was the Director of Credit at Dragonfly and then together mm -hmm. they scaled that business sold it to Octopus but that Dragonfly was very much part of the Octopus group while I was there and yeah in, I saw that happening the scale of that business growing at some pace and then eventually being sold so it was actually when when Octane launched, I actually wrote, um, got in contact with Octane directly to request an interview, and I saw that Jonathan oh, really? was starting a new business. Yeah, so I contacted them. Ah, oh, right. And uh, does that help that you know you've been with them in the past, or you've been within that business before? I'm kind of I'm leaning towards the the mentorship type question. Um, I don't know how close you are there, but that made a difference having a kind of a leader that you've seen grow and scale a business before and then and then join them again yeah and it's funny you say that because when i was i remember i still remember them talk about robotically repeating pitches i can still remember my pitch of, <laughs> of one of the investment products that we were selling at Op octopus and we used to sell this um venture capital product and it was all about early stage investing and we used to tell people that you don't worry about the product you invest in the team and you know, you need mm. to pack serial entrepreneurs and you need to, you know, when you find these people, they're very rare. And I, and I always remember that it's kind of ingrained in my brain. But that was what really drove me because I saw Jonathan and Matt um, build, scale and sell Dragonfly Property Finance. And then I saw them starting a new business and I just thought, I want to be, I want to be a More part of that. that. I want to be a part of that. Look, outside of the fact that then good guys and I've always got on with them and you know yeah. from, from a commercial perspective it was like look, if these guys are going at it again 
I'm, I'm in, you know, count me in. See, I think, I think that's really exciting. Others, you're either excited about that or you're not, right? I think, because obviously we work with different levels of lenders or brokers at all different stages of their, of their journey. And I think there's a place for everyone. Like you're super excited because you've seen the journey and you want to build it. Um, and then others might be, I don't, I'm just trying to name a lender, but they've got everything in place or their process in place and it's relatively easy. You can just slip in. Um, but you've got to be right. That's got to be part of your, your journey, right? You've got to, I think it's what's really important is that my, my point is, is that people have to really think about that when they're joining someone. Um, yeah. As to where they are on the journey, how much input you're going to have in that in that journey. Yeah, um, I mean, I was did you, did you, and obviously you thought about that. Yeah, I mean, look, I didn't jump. I wasn't like employee number two. That I think Octane had already been lending for nine, ten months before I joined. So, um, mm. you know, in terms of, I wasn't That's fairly new. <laughs> yeah, new, but I mean, Octane started lending at scale from day one. Um, so right. you know, it was pretty obvious that that trajectory had started by the time I joined. So, <laughs> You know, yeah. that, that, that really You're, you were bravish. Yeah, I definitely, yeah, definitely didn't jump. In. <laughs> I don't think they would have had me, to be honest. Uh, right at the start, <laughs> I joined with no experience in property finance at all. Um, I was actually quite surprised that I got the job. I remember leaving the interview thinking, Did they, well, I was going to say that actually. So they just see something in you. They know you. You know they know you're a drafter, <laughs> and they just thought you could do it. I don't know, to be honest, because like I said, I left the interview thinking that did that did not go well. <laughs> and just thought, <laughs> well, you, know, you win some, you lose some. But I think it, I think it helped in that they they'd obviously known me from um, Octopus and at least had known that my numbers in terms of perfor- sales performance was good when yeah. I was there. So I guess that was in my corner. Um, and look, and yeah, they've I, seen your work, the work ethic, and that kind of thing. Because right, yeah. you can teach anyone a product, mm. but yeah. they, they obviously had seen your behaviours before. Yeah, sure. But I mean, I was brand brand new to property finance, other than the fact that I have some sort of family connection to to that, and that my dad spent his entire career in specialist mortgages, so I had a base okay. level understanding from him. Um, Around the Sunday roast type understanding of uh, yeah, yeah. Um, talking about commercial finance. But by no means a uh, by no means an expert. But that was it, you know. Joined and then just tried to learn as much as as much as I could. But that, that, mm. that's one of the reasons why I loved it so much because there's so much to learn. Um, yeah, very very. So how do how do you think? Without uh, this makes people awkward when you talk about because you've got to talk about why you're good. But why, how do you think you've gone up the ladder relatively quickly? What do you think is the difference maker? Um. It's actually uh, listening to Dimitri on your last podcast. He said something that resonated with me, which I agreed with completely, which is you just have to work as hard as you possibly can. Um, mm. And my, I've got an online coach, um, like Stroke PT, and he has a great saying, um, out, outwork your self-doubt. Um, so yeah. shout, out, shout out to Nick. But he, yeah, I think that is a great sentiment in that, you can have all the talent in the world. And this is so true, especially in the BDM space, which is irrespective of how good you are, you can easily be outworked by somebody mm. that isn't as good. So that was my that was my thing when I joined, which was I would go and go and meet anybody that would be willing to meet me three and a half thousand miles a month in the car, all over yeah. the country. You know, the young guys. I hope I hope a lot of brokers take this into consideration as well because I obviously, well, I work both sides of the, the fence. That I speak to brokers all the time. I'm like, oh, I just want that BDM role. I think they think that's where you go to have a cushy life. And I don't think everyone understands the amount. If I, because I, obviously I have top. Anyone on here has generally done pretty well, mm. and not one of them says it hasn't been a really hard graft. Not yeah. one person says, oh, it's, it was nice. It was a nice sell. It's, it, you have to work yeah. really hard. And it should be hard. And because it, because if it was, if it was easy, then. Um, you know, it wouldn't be financially rewarded. You get paid too well. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be, would it? And, you, and there's a re- there's a really unglamorous side to the BDM role. You know, petrol station sandwiches. Um, you know, trying to trying to drink your coffee and spilling it all down your shirt. Do you know what? I I always I always consider myself a travelling salesman, and I always do that joke of if I'm in a nice restaurant with a client. I take a picture and I send it to the ladies in the office and they say, your job is really glamorous. My job is about cost of coffee and a, and a sausage roll jumping on a tube of grubby hands 
and then yeah. make it to the next arm. But in, yeah. everyone's like, oh, yours is quite nice because you work on the client side and you do that and you're like, yeah, yeah, I, I've shown you one meal this week. The rest of it's been at a petrol station, like you say, or, or grabbing, a, grabbing a chocolate bar or running into a tube. Yeah, this, uh, this side of the sales shop, they then tell you about you need to become adept at <laughs> arranging pens on a trestle table. And picking your meal deal properly. To <laughs> <see for your exactly. laughs> yeah, but it's still, and, and this is something that I, um, one thing that I maybe took from my first job where we, it was, that was so unglamorous, you know, 100 plus cold calls a day and you'd get told where to go 98 times. But that, you know, even now... That's a great standing, though. That's a great standing for, for someone to do. I would yeah. love it if not... Well, I don't know if I'd love it if my kids did it, but it's, it's not the end of the world if they went and just got told to get lost 99 times out of 100. Yeah. I, I, I speak to a lot of quality salespeople who that's how they started there. I'm not sure that was going to work for the next generation, but it'd be interesting to see. Yeah, but I think even now, you, even now I tell, tell myself you shouldn't be too proud to make a cold call. Like, look, Octane are an established business in our space, but let's be real, there are firms out there that have been doing this for much longer than us, and there are hundreds, if not thousands of brokers that probably have no idea who we are. So, mm. you know, if you only talk to the brokers that know you, you're never gonna grow and scale the business. So all of us, me included, you know, I put time aside in my diary every week to to do the horrible bit, you know, if, yeah. it's, it's not nice calling someone that doesn't really want to speak to you, that's never heard of you. And I think it's different, it, like you're not, you're in a nice space because you're giving someone something of value on it. It's very different from the, the old type of cold calling days. It's still a, you've got, you, you've got a good client base, haven't you? And you've got an element of um, being known in the market. So it's a little bit easier than the back of the day of your, uh, your hundred cold calls. But I know what you mean. It's still not, the same. It's not, still not as nice as speaking to the broker that uses you. Yeah, but like but you say, it's no no challenge. Yeah, but there's loads of brokers that don't know us. So don't get me wrong. You know, when we're when we're out trying to make new broker relationships, there's still brokers, especially again coming back to the ones that maybe don't do much bridging. There's still an opportunity there. If you're a resi and mm. buy to let broker and you've never done bridging before, you almost definitely won't have heard of who Octane are. But that doesn't mean that we can't do business together. That blows my mind that people haven't heard of people, but that's because it's my job to know everyone, isn't it? So I always think it's strange that, even I think it's strange that brokers don't know what each other's broker around the corner does, or um, people, because it's quite insular, isn't it, if you're doing your thing. Um, I always think everyone should know everyone like I do, but then that's my job to know everyone, isn't it? So I suppose it's very different if you're, um, if you're in your job. No, we're fortunate, I think, in the, if you're a bridging, a broker that does a lot of bridging, hopefully you know at least know of octane um now mm. you know we're a seven year old business we've lent one and a half billion yeah. pounds we're pretty established we're definitely one of the cheapest in the market so you'd, you'd hope that you know bridging brokers know who yeah, we no, are yeah yeah so there's lots of new people coming to the market as well isn't there lots of resi brokers moving into it so there's always new business to be done and by the way outwork yourself doubt is a very good chance that's going to be the uh that's going to be the headline of this uh, podcast because well, I love that. If you're going to do that, then my, my good friend and coach, Nick Naidu, should take full credit for that quote because that's his, <laughs> his mantra. Um, I'll find him before I do this. I'll credit it. I won't. Yeah, I'll say it's me. I'll, I'll edit all of this I'll edit, and I'll say I, I've made it. <laughs> He's, um, who is he for you? Is your, on, is your coach? Yeah, it's actually someone. So my, my, um, my father passed away back in... Um, end of 2022 actually almost simultaneously Sorry, very bizarrely with me um getting this this promotion and um it was at that point that i decided to try and sort of channel my grief into um sort of exercise and trying to get in better shape and i found that as a coping mechanism really helpful and a good friend of mine nick is a um is a is a PT and a, and an online coach, but as part of this program, you get access to a mindset coach. Um, yeah. And I've just found it unbelievably useful, if if I'm honest, just to kind of channel that that you know I found it very hard to deal with with losing him and yeah, but channeling that into physical activity and having you know I'm I'm training for a triathlon in June in his memory. 
for raising some money for oh, nice. the Brain Tumor UK, um, who are, he, he passed away um, from a brain tumor. And yeah, I just think that that kind of channeling into something positive has, has really helped me nice. mentally cope with it. Yeah, I, I completely resonates with me, by the way. My, I lost my father at the end of uh, at Christmas in 22. So um, exactly the same. Actually finding that avenue to, um, to construct, because it can't just be about work all the time, can it? You have to find right. um, you know, alternative avenues. And as men, we are notoriously, you know, I'm the same as most in that my, it drives my wife, my wife mad because you don't, you know, don't talk about it maybe as much as you should. Um, mm. I found physical exercise a great remedy for any negative feeling that I have in, you know, in, in, in yeah. my mind. You know. That's amazing. And the mindset coaching was brilliant. And by the way, actually, you know, so men don't talk about it. It's the first time I've said that within a working thing so it's interesting that, you would, uh, that we, we don't say enough but the, the mindset side of things is massive right i've got i've had a mindset coach is a game changer for me had it got two or three That's years right. ago just getting just unleashing the potential in you is, is huge right totally yeah yeah and it's, it's changed that's actually changed loads for me you know i've stopped stopped drinking started exercising way more than i did before um and the kind of the knock-on effect that it's had on other facets of my life, sleep, energy, performance at work, you slowly realise huge, isn't it? these other things start improving and then your life is just mm. incrementally getting better and you think, you know, this is, this is really good. And that all started from something that was really bad that happened, you know, and, and actually yeah. the knock-on effect has been some good things, you know. Oh, good, good. Amazing. Um, yeah, like I said, I think the, um, the, the mindset side of things is huge. And if anyone takes anything from that, I think it's well worth looking at it. So don't, it's very hard to do yourself mm. without someone coaching you. It's, some of the stuff's really obvious as well, right? Like some, some things you've heard, some things you should have blinding the obvious. But when someone says it to you and you actually have to you, you work on it, I think coaching for me is the best money I've ever spent. Investing in myself for that is, is by far better than anything I've ever done. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally agree. And um, yeah, it's definitely, definitely helps me. Good, good, good. All right, well, I will, uh, before I start welling up, I'll be talking about that. Right. If, uh, if, if anyone wants to get hold of you, Josh, and obviously I have a chat with you about anything we've talked about, and obviously about Octane and, um, and the, the products that you have, how, what's the best way to get hold of you? All of your social media will be on our social media, obviously, for this. But if anyone's listening now and wants to speak to you, what's the best way of speaking to you? So firstly, visit our hopefully new website by the time this goes live, octanecapital.co.uk. Um, and then, yeah, um, I'll maybe give you my direct contact details and the details yeah. of the BDM team. We've got a great BDM team that covers the entirety of the country. So um, irrespective of where you are, you should have somebody that's pretty nearby that can, um, that can help you. Amazing. Thank you very much for your time today, Josh. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone listening. Um, I hope you got uh, some good information from that. Um, and everyone, see everyone watching on YouTube as well. Cheers, Josh. I appreciate your time. No worries. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye.